Uh, what I'm pleased to talk to you about is a topic that really I've been working on for um, more than a decade, and that is youth concussion with a focus on return to learn. So what I wanna convey in the next 20 minutes is really, um, you know, how do we define concussion, the prevalence and symptoms, what are its impacts on learning, um, talk a little bit about the national landscape, and then focus on a new program that we've developed here at the University of Washington called uh, the, the RISE program, which addresses student-centered return to learn care uh, in public high schools across the state. So first of all, um, we I think we all recognize that traumatic brain injury, which concussion is, is a major public health problem. The most common form of traumatic brain injury is often called mild TBI, but what I'll share with you is that mild TBI isn't always so mild. Residual symptoms, delays in diagnosis, and the lack of a coordinated healthcare system that prevents seamless communication between uh, primary care physicians and schools and acute care clinics often renders students, particularly from minority backgrounds, at a disadvantage in terms of receiving optimal care. The most common cause of TBI, including uh, mild traumatic brain injuries, falls, followed by motor vehicle crashes and then assault. For sports-related TBI, I'll share with you some of the um, uh, gender-based uh, sports activities that are associated with concussion. Many of our uh, patients who we see in our clinics and, and folks in our community who have concussion are youth, and this results in a lot of disability. In 1996, Congress passed the TBI Act to help reduce the burden of TBI death and disability. So how do we define concussion? The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention defines concussion as a mild traumatic brain injury resulting from a direct blow or transmission or impulsive force to the head that is rapid onset, short-lived neurological impairment. But the challenge here, and I really want us to think this way, is it's mild isn't really so mild. This affects a large number of students and the Berlin Consensus Statement, which addresses concussion, really does not provide any guidance on how schools should support students with concussion. So let's compare what we call mild traumatic brain injury with that of concussion. For those of us who are in medicine, we'll recognize the Glasgow Coma Scale Score, which is a uh, crude neurological score that assesses the severity of traumatic brain injury. Very similar, mild TBI concussion, 14, 15 or similar. Uh, some differences in whether, you know, we call something having a single episode or repetitive, but in general, there's a lot of overlap. Again, the first major point I wanna just share here is that concussion is a traumatic brain injury. Many people didn't used to think it was, thinking it was associated something very specific to football or soccer, but in fact, it's a TBI. If you look at the incidence of concussions and compare boys sports to girls sports, you'll see that boys sports here is the graph on the, on the left is associated with football, whereas girls sports, the incidence of concussion is associated with soccer. And so there is a difference in athletic activity and therefore association between concussion and sport by sex. Now this graph on the left here which shows the number of hits on the y-axis and on the x-axis going across is age, shows that between youth and high school, there's a significant number of hits to the head that are experienced in football. Now, this, this increase kind of peaks around late high school, early college, and then decreases thereafter. Now, isn't it interesting that this increase in this pattern sort of mirrors the trajectories of brain development by age, which means that the more number of hits to the head that is developing critical processes may lead to abnormal brain development. So if we examine the National Health Interview Survey data, 
we'll see that about in 2020, uh, students aged zero to 17 years, about 7% reported ever having symptoms of concussion or a brain injury. That's 7% of our country, of our youth this age. But if you then look at what the same respondents who said that, how many respondents received a diagnosis of concussion or brain injury by a healthcare professional, it's about half, three and a half, four percent which means that the diagnosis of concussion or TBI is not really being made in a timely manner. So how do we test for concussion? There are checklists um, that can be used at uh, the site of sport and also in clinics. Um, in order for these screening tests to be deployed, one must come to a athletic trainer or a healthcare provider and say, look, I've hit my head or I play sports and I fell and I hit my head and I'm having these symptoms. So, so I think one of the challenges that, um, that young people face is the fact that concussion is invisible. There's a lot of social stigma, uh, particularly for athletes to having to disclose because of the return to play law that exists in Washington state where athletes who have concussion are not allowed to return. And so they feel a lot of pressure. In addition, there are inequities in, the, in how many schools have athletic trainers across the state. Um, and the athletic trainers are wonderful in that they can uh, elicit, detect, and appropriately provide care for uh, students with concussion and keep them from being hurt again. But again, there's an inequitable distribution of athletic directors across the state. So the invisibility is really a, um, is a challenge. So the good news is most concussion symptoms resolve within two weeks. So that's what we can expect. The challenge is given the number of folks who are having concussions in the state, about 14% have persistent symptoms at three months. And the studies have shown that students who have persistent concussive symptoms at three months have problems with academics. And that, because there's no return to learn law in Washington state, becomes a problem because school students fall behind. So the concussion symptoms th that parents should alert schools about and schools should elicit um, if there's a history of trauma is headache, dizziness, balance issues, vomiting, sensitivity, blurry vision, a number of cognitive issues, emotional lability, and problems with sleep. So now you can see these are very general symptoms, S symptoms that adolescents experience on a daily basis without concussion. So now you su superimpose this episode of concussion and you can see how easy it is for concussion diagnosis to be missed because these symptoms could be attributed to other things such as normal development, adolescence, you know, staying up late, not, not getting enough sleep for other reasons. So this becomes a problem with diagnosis. Our early work in Washington state with 15 public high schools showed that on average, students with concussion report 12 symptoms in week one, 12. By week two, it's seven or eight. Week three, it's five and week four, it's four. Now that means this is consistent with the published literature suggesting that by two weeks, most recover. But as you can see, some don't past a month. And the number of symptoms that students uh, present with to their school nurses is pretty significant. And if schools don't have nurses, then the question is, who to whom do students report these symptoms? In this work, we found the 10 most frequently reported symptoms in week one were headache, feeling drowsy and sleepy, feeling slowed down, difficulty concentrating, sensitivity to light, feeling fatigued, feeling mentally foggy, sleeping more, difficulty remembering, and sensitivity to sound. So some of these symptoms can be accommodated and some may just require the student to take some rest and return when they're able. In addition, suicidal thoughts are common post-concussion and history of depression is a strong risk factor. 
So the idea here is that we really need to think about screening and developing tailored interventions that are needed to address mental health in this population. When we began this work in 2017, that's five years ago, we began to hear stories from school nurses and school personnel that said, oh, this student who has had repeated concussions attempted suicide. So there is a strong interplay between mental health and concussion outcomes that really needs to be co considered. But until we fully understand how common concussions are in the state of Washington, and we fully understand how to provide support for students, I'm afraid we're not gonna be able to get to this. So how should we be treating concussion? So there are some guiding principles for return to learn in the schools. There, there should be an initial period of cognitive rest, a gradual increase in stimulation as tolerated, and there needs to be collaboration between family, healthcare providers, and school personnel. So the workload may need to be temporarily reduced. There may need to be breaks, frequent reassessment of symptoms, and limiting environmental stimulation. All this requires attention to these students who have complaints. And so the recommendations are to adjust accommodations based on symptoms. Now, amidst all of this, we did some work trying to understand what's the impact of concussion on family and finance. And when we did this one study, families report initiating care needs most of the time. Barriers to receiving care for concussion and timely care are communication between medical providers and school staff, insufficient knowledge on what to do, and lack of school protocols and services, thereby needing systemic and systematic solutions. In addition, families are spending out-of-pocket money for, um, you know, to provide additional tutoring, uh, parental sick leave costs money, and students are missing school. Now, for families who can afford it, this is doable. For many of our families whose students are in sports and who have concussions, this is really a problem. So there's been some controversy around, um, you know, how much rest should students receive after concussion? And these professional societies vary in their specific recommendations. I would say the consensus probably uh, rests somewhere around tailored graduated return to activity and modification um, of, of school requirements. So how do we pr predict who's going to recover quickly? When we looked at our data, what we found was the more number of symptoms that students endorsed and reported early when they presented to their school nurses, the longer it took. That makes sense, right? Probably a worse history, a more severe concussion than otherwise. So higher initial severity in, in 10 of the most common symptoms, more number of symptoms, um, and higher severity of headache initially were very predictive as were more sleepiness and dizziness. And when we uh, examined this accommodation profile that was provided in our cohort of schools who enrolled in this work, what you'll see here is the number of weekly accommodations was over a thousand. So if we actually ask students if, they've, if they have a concussion and note the symptoms that they're having and map accommodations to symptoms, schools are going to actually have to provide a significant number of accommodations to meet student need. And that, as we can all imagine, is, is stressful and particularly has been stressful during the pandemic. So students require extra time on assignments, removal from PE, course accommodations, rest breaks, so these all requires resources. We conducted a study during the pandemic to understand what happened to return to learn care in the state. Well, as we remember, the learning platform during the pandemic evolved. There was no school in March of 2020. School then went fully online in April of 2020 and was hybrid by March of 2021. And remembering that Washington state has no return to learn law, but it does have a return to play law. 
This is concerning to us. In fact, schools who responded to us shared with us that one third of schools received zero guidance on how to manage the change of platform because everything is had became virtual at some point. How do you care and provide support and academics for students with concussion? Half of the schools felt students with concussion were struggling more during the pandemic. This means they're probably behind. Return to learn accommodation provision was associated with larger student body number and graduation rate, suggesting that more resources to schools was associated with with more tailored accommodations. Again, widening the disparities between rural and urban schools and between larger and more resource schools compared to smaller schools. This figure on this slide shows in red the accommodations that the responding schools provided to students with concussion. Lots of white means lots of holes. In other words, schools didn't know what to do and couldn't manage. And then if you look at the boxes shaded in blue, that represents the, ab, the uh, some written policy on return to learn. So you can see here that there's a lot of schools that don't, didn't really have any and don't have any return to learn policies. So if you combine absence of policy with absence of practice, the folks who are suffering are the students. So Washington State led the nation in developing a return to play law. That's what the purple is. Every state in the country followed suit and everybody got on board. But if you look at return to learn laws, as of, as of this has really increased only a little bit in the last few years, very few states have return to learn laws and Washington state does not. And in fact, if you look at Washington state itself, anywhere between 47 and 77% of school districts nationally actually do not have return to learn protocols. This is Washington state. So the districts with formal guidelines are in yellow and the schools with formal guidelines are in mustard. So most of the state doesn't really have any formal guidance. So what should schools in Washington state be doing? Well, first, there are five essential components of a return to learn protocol that schools should adopt that is considered best practice by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. First, identifying screening and having assessment processes within schools. There should also be systematic communication between medical and educational systems. There should be a way to track students over time. There should be professional development around concussion and return to learn for school personnel. And we should have outcome measures to actually measure academic successes for students with concussion because they're at risk of being forgotten. Return to learn, as I mentioned, should be gradual and customized within schools. There should be a process for monitoring academic progress that should be collaborative. And students with prolonged symptoms over four weeks sh should see a specialist. Screen time should not entirely be banned. So in response to this, what I call a real public health crisis here in Washington state, because we just don't, we know it's a large number. We don't have a plan to solve this. We developed what we called a return to learn implementation bundle for schools. And we had three specific aims. And this project is funded by the CDC. The first aim is to determine the effects of this bundle implementation on the presence of a return to learn program. The second is to determine school factors associated with achieving model implementation. And the third is to look at the effect of the model implementation on student outcomes. Our goal at the Harborview Injury Prevention Research Center and at UW Medicine is to really um, develop, Im test, implement, and disseminate a scientifically rigorous and robust return to learn program for the state of Washington. What does our return to learn program consist of? It consists of a coached implementation and a student packet with symptom checklists and tailored accommodations 
that a school champion who does not have to be a nurse can use. The student will check in with the return to learn champion, will endorse symptoms. We have an evidence-based expert guided uh, a care pathway that, um, that the return to learn champion can use to suggest accommodations. And there are scripts in the program that can facilitate communication between school and parent and between parent and primary care provider. Now, amidst the uh, testing of this program during the pandemic was a law that was passed in June 2020 that we just became aware of about two months ago, which is House Bill 2731, which requires public schools K through 12 across the state to annually report information about each diagnosed concussion sustained by a student during athletics and other activities. There are minimum requ reporting requirements, such as student grade, event date, injury details, medical examination, et cetera. This law charges the Department of Health to develop a procedure to collect specified information related to students with concussion and annually report concussion information received in the prior year. What's missing? There's no requirement for a return to learn care plan. So we are in the process of working with the Department of Health to try and see what we can do to introduce a return to learn program for the state. So our study, which enrolled, which has enrolled 14 public high schools in our return to learn program is, is across, this, across the state. Um, and there are, there's representation from Eastern Washington, six schools are in Eastern Washington, eight schools are in Western Washington. We have a rural urban distribution and we have a range of students. So we can test if our return to learn program is feasible, is acceptable, will result in accommodations being provided to students and uh, is sustainable. So the fact that this law was passed suggests that we don't have a good handle on how many concussions there are in Washington state annually for our, for our children. And so because these data don't exist, we've sort of extrapolated what we've learned through the study to make some back of the envelope calculations. So during an eight month period between August, 2021 and March, 2022, our 14 Washington state public high schools, this is not K through 12, this is just high school and just public high schools, reported to us 192 concussions. If you extrapolate this and multiply this to account for a whole year and account for um, the total number of 700 plus high schools that there are in the state of Washington, for high schools alone, we are estimating and 18,000 students have concussions annually. You have to add to that the number of students in middle school and elementary school. And what we are hearing from educators and school nurses at elementary and middle school is a call for the development of concussion care in schools uh, for those age groups as well. So now the number is huge. And we've shared these data with the Department of Health. This is a graph that shows the month on the x-axis and number on the y-axis. And these different graphs refer to the schools that were that joined the program in different time points. We intentionally staggered um, enrollment um, into this study uh, because of the study design. But what you can see here is that overall, we see a peak in the incidence of number of concussions in public high schools sometime around the fall. And then we are now entering, we are in April, we are seeing an uptick again between January and March, coinciding likely with spring sports. So again, this is probably fall sports and this is probably spring sports. We're going to be continuing this work into the fall of next year so we can 
examine the, um, the information over a one year period, the COVID pandemic uh, kind of interfered with our ability to do this work fully during the uh, first uh, year cycle. So to conclude, I think I, I, I'm hoping that, you know, what I've been able to successfully convey is that concussion symptoms are grossly underrecognized and undertreated, and there are large racial and ethnic disparities in access to care. There's a new law in town, and it's really good because we'll be over the next one to two years by the time the processes get put in place for schools to respond and the Department of Health evaluates the data, we'll get a sense of the concussion and TBI burden in the state. But that doesn't really address our issue of providing service to our students. The COVID-19 pandemic posed significant challenges to conducting the original study that we designed, but what we, we were able to do is learn from schools that students with concussion struggled more during this past year. Washington State's public high schools are eager to participate and in desperate need of a return to learn program. And the return to learn champions are reporting increasing workloads associated with COVID tasks in schools. But what we're learning is they're still managing to implement the program that we've developed because I, they think it's important. And the RISE bundle that we've developed and the RTL program could be a feasible avenue to implement student-centered and tailored accommodations for concussion symptoms across our state. There are free return to learn resources available for, for everyone to, to use and to learn. The Department of Health and Human Services has um, informational videos and trainings and support groups across our state. And there are, the CDC website is also another very good uh, source of information. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank my colleagues here at the University of Washington. Um, I know I'm joined by Aspen Avery, who's our research coordinator um, here today. And um, without whom this work really wouldn't be possible. So. Thank you very much. Um, and I look forward to uh, discussing this with you during our chat session. I'll stop sharing at this point. Thank you, Monica, that was great. Uh, I'd just like to remind our, our participants that if you have questions, please type them into the Q&A uh, section that you see at the bottom of your screen. We will hold the questions until after, uh, after Dr. Patel's remarks and we'll have a robust discussion with all of our participants. So at this time, I'd like to thank Monica and we'll turn it over to Dr. Patel. Very fantastic talk, Monica. Um, share a screen here. And can someone confirm that you can see my slide? Um, Got it. Got it, all right, thank you very, very much. Okay, so, um, so I'm gonna pick up and focus on the other end of the age spectrum here by focusing on falls prevention in older adults. And um, in contrast to Dr. Vavilala, I am a epidemiologist, gerontologist. So um, I don't have the clinical background, but um, um, what I hope to share with you today is um, a little bit more, a better understanding of the burden of falls among older adults, um, as well as identifying common risk factors for falling and then describe um, interventions for reducing falls risk. And I just wanna start out by providing some sort of demographic context for um, this evening's lecture. And that is, um, I think apparent for most people that uh, our population is aging. Um, in the next, you know, by 2050, uh, the number of older adults in the United States, those who are 65 and older will double, um, reaching 90 million. Um, um, and that the, uh, the most rapidly growing segment of our population are those who are 85 and older. And so this has um, a significant import for a variety of um, aspects of, of society, but particularly public health and healthcare. 
And I just want to uh, highlight here that the, um, the population aging is not just uh, uh, limited to US or other high income countries. It's affecting the whole world. Um, both middle income and low income countries are experiencing rapid population aging because fertility rates have decreased over time rapidly in these countries as well. And that uh, um, survival is starting to improve globally. So as epidemiologists, I think it's important for us to focus, uh, to make, make sure we're all on the same page. And so I wanted to start out with a definition of a fall, and this is a widely accepted definition here. So a fall is an unexpected event in which a person comes to rest on the floor, uh, ground, or at a lower level. And here in the United States, every second, an older person falls. Um, so that means there's, in 2018, there were 36 million falls that resulted in 8 million injuries, 3 million ED visits, and a, a nearly 1 million hospitalizations, and approximately 32,000 deaths. So, um, oops. Projecting forward to 2030, um, which is only eight years from now, um, we will have approximately eight, uh, 73 million older adults in the United States and then um, the number of falls will increase to 52 million and um, the number of injuries will also increase by over a third to 12 million. So in terms of leading causes of death, unintentional injuries in older adults are the seventh leading cause of death. And among unintentional injuries, falls are the leading uh, causes, cause of death in this category. So um, falls is, uh, as I mentioned, a leading cause of, of uh, uh, injury-related death in the country as a whole. And in terms of how we're doing here in Washington state, you can see that the green line um, that we have a higher falls related mortality rate than the country as a whole. Um, I think what's striking here um, that everyone can appreciate is that the, the rate of falls related deaths is increasing um, both in our state as well as um, nationally. Um, and you might think to yourself, well, this might be a result of you know, the population is aging, but even when we take into account the age structure of the population, you still see this rapid increase or this, uh, this increase in falls related mortality. And over the last 20 years, um, um, the, the rate of falls related injury or mortality has increased by 37% in, in Washington. And so this is the distribution of, of um, falls related death rates by age group and by gender. And you can see that um, with increasing with advancing age, um, the falls fall related mortality rate increases. It's particularly dramatic among those who are 80 and older. Um, interestingly, uh, you do also start to see when you look at nationally, you see a crossover effect whereby the falls related mortality rate is higher in men at younger ages. Um, and then at, in um, the 70s and 80s, you see a crossover where women have a higher uh, falls related mortality rate than, than men. Here, these are Washington state data and um, showing similar, similar um, mortality rates from falls in men and women. And these are data from 2020. I should have said that this, these are data courtesy of Washington, Washington State Department of Health. Um, Dana Drum is, our, is the epidemiologist who um, compiled these data for us. Um, I think I, I'd also wanted to just point out that there is racial ethnic variation in falls related mortality. And here we see that uh, non Hispanic whites have the highest um, uh, death rate from falls. And this is also true um, nationally that the highest death rates for falls um, related mortality are, sorry, falls related mortality are highest in non Hispanic whites um, and lower in other groups. And we'll come back to this. Um, one possibility for um, not seeing much um, uh, higher rates in other groups is potentially because of misclassification um, in death certificate data. And I'll come back to that in a few slides. 
Uh, sorry for the graininess, but this is also just to highlight that uh, the mortality, the falls related mortality rates do vary geographically. And uh, since you all, most for most most of the audience is in the eastern um, um, part of the uh, the, um, the emergency medical um, service region, um, I just want to highlight that the falls related mortality rate is highest. Um, in the um, in that area, um, these colors don't relate to any um, um, to the, the actual mortality rate. It's just to highlight the eight regions are eight trauma regions or EMS uh, regions in in our state. In terms of hospitalization, there is some um, uh, suspicion that it's possible that there might be a lower lowering of the uh, falls related more uh, falls related hospitalization rate because of COVID-19 but we really didn't see that these are just the number of hospitalizations and it dipped a little but approximately 22,000 hospitalizations are a result of a fall among the older adult population and this uh, same pattern occurs when we look at the actual rate so these are just the, the total numbers so 22,000 and when we look at the rates by age here you can see that the uh, um, again that the the rate of hospitalizations increase from falls increases with advancing age and there's higher um, uh, generally higher in women than in men at the older ages and here i wanted to show um, that um, in terms of race ethnicity again you do see a very a high rate of hospitalization due to falls among non-Hispanic whites, but you also see it in our indigenous population, American Indian, Indian and Alaska Natives, as well as Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders in Washington state. You do um, see comparable um, high rates of hospitalization in these two populations that are more likely to have misclassification in their death certificates. Um, so these are data where the patient is asked to identify their race, ethnicity, or um, a caregiver. So it's conceivable that these data are a little bit more, um, uh, more valid um, in terms of race, race, ethnicity. And this comports, this picture you see here also comports, uh, aligns with um, other sources of data to say that, um, um, that the, the mix of comorbidities in these uh, populations would predispose them to a higher falls risk. And because of we're looking at hospitalizations, we can sort of lower the mi microscope and look at county uh, variation across counties. And so coming back to the Eastern Medical um, uh, Emergency Medical um, Service region, you can see that Stevens County um, has a higher rate of, of uh, falls related hospitalizations and uh, Spokane has an intermediate rate similar to King County where we where I'm at right now in Seattle. Um, but just to show here that a lot of um, um, geographic variation that might be attributable to um, uh, in limited access to falls prevention resources. There we go. Now, the, um, in terms of the, the functional consequences of falls, I just want to um, focus here on the right side. So uh, pan, uh, the right side of this panel, this graphic. And just to say that this, this is, uh, uh, comes from a really nice study in which they, it's a population-based study in which they interview um, older adults on a monthly basis about their functioning and, um, and they've done this for over a decade. And so you have a rich amount of data. And what they did was they looked at um, um, before and after a um, serious falls related injury. And so just focusing on the consequences right now, um, uh, um, approximately 40% of those who had a significant or who had a serious falls related injury did not um, recover. So the Y axis here reflects the total number of disabilities. Um, think about activities of daily living, the inability to bathe, um, dress oneself, um, feed oneself. Um, so um, higher numbers of disability um, um, 
we see that 40% uh, of those who experienced a serious falls related injury were not able to recover. Um, and um, another 20% had very little recovery in terms of their disability. But then a quarter um, have a gradual recovery and only a, a tenth, approximately a tenth, have a rapid recovery in their functioning. So all this is to say that the functional consequences of falls are significant. Um, oh, you know what? I think I skipped. Yes, I'm sorry. I skipped a slide here um, because there was some delay in my in my PowerPoint. But I uh, wanted to highlight that uh, falls are a leading cause of um, TBI and among older adults. And so focusing here on the left um, side of the, of, of the slide is hospitalizations. And so this last row here are, um, six, are people who are 60 and older. And you can see here that the rate per 100,000 is approximately 127 versus people who are less than 60. Um, the rate is 12. So there's um, nearly a tenfold um, increase uh, rate of hospitalization from TBI um, among older adults than in younger adults. Um, I also would like to point out that of the 2,634 hospitalizations in TBI related hospitalizations in the state, 2,233 of them were um, from a fall. Um, and then in terms of ED visits, which was on this right side, Again, you see that older adults have a higher um, uh, TBI-related ED visit rate than compared to younger adults, um, uh, a three to four-fold difference. Um, but that the, the, the causes of TBI-related uh, ED visits um, um, are many-fold, and it's not um, uh, dominated by, oops, it's not dominated by um, falls. There are other causes of TBI related ED visits. Okay, so in terms of risk factors for the students, I just wanted to highlight that um, that uh, this type of work to understand what what uh, contributes to um, the risk of disease or to um, in this case a, a geriatric syndrome of falls. Um, um, in order to really understand. Um, and prevent um, an adverse um, health condition or event, you have to do epidemiologic research. And here in this case, Mary Tinetti, which is who is one of my uh, heroes, um, did this work in the uh, late 80s in which she um, conducted a well-designed um, uh, prospective uh, one-year cohort study in which she did a comprehensive assessment of 336 older adults who are 70 and older and assess them for a range of potential risk factors for falling and then follow them up on a monthly basis um, and um, by phone to identify falls uh, risk factors. And what she found was, oops, I'm sorry, I don't know why that keeps happening. What she found was is that, um, that individual risk factors such as um, um, uh, cognitive impairments, muscle weakness, balance, all contributed to a higher risk of falling. But importantly, that these risk factors tend to cluster and that the total, that as you accumulate risk factors, your risk of falling increases dramatically. And you can see that here very nicely in this graphic. Um, and so as a result of this um, observational work, Dr. Ten uh, uh, sorry, I, I meant to also highlight that Dr. Tanetti then has gone on and others, many others have contributed to this literature. There was a nice review published in 2010 by Dr. Uh, Tanetti and Kumar in which they laid out what are the common risk factors, um, highlighted um, uh, classic studies that identify these risk factors and the strengths of association between these, these risk factors and the risk of falling. And so, the number one risk factor for falls is having a history of falling. So in fact, it's recommended that when you see an older adult for even a well visit, that you ask um, your older patient, um, have you fallen in the past year? Um, also, as you can imagine, balance, having uh, 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 difficulty with balance and muscle weakness are risk factors for falls, as are uh, visual impairment 
and polypharmacy and specific medications like sedative use, antidepressants, opioids, all contribute to higher risk of falling. And there's a variety of other um, risk factors. Of course, the one that you all saw earlier is age, advancing age is a, is a risk factor. So um, can you, continuing on, so after Dr. Tanay published the sort of seminal epidemiologic uh, paper on identifying risk factors and that you really have a clustering, that these risk factors tend to cluster, um, she then um, went out and conducted a multifactorial intervention to intervene on um, individual risk factors. Um, and which, so what she did was she had a nurse do a comprehensive assessment and then for each risk factor had a corresponding intervention, um, a nurse as well as physical therapist. So for those who had impairments in gait and balance, they had physical therapy to address their gait and uh, balance issues. They also went into these the homes and did a home hazard assessment and um, um, made recommendations and changes in the home environment. And all of this contributed to a, a reduction in the falls related uh, in the in, uh, risk of falling in the intervention group um, that's shown here in black and then the controls are the, um, the upper line. So she clearly, uh, Dr. Tenetti has clearly showed that um, this was uh, amongst one of the early studies showing that multifactorial intervention can reduce the risk of falling. However, um, sorry about that. Yes, um, yeah, that's the right slide. Uh, nope. Okay, so, um, so that was an early multifactorial intervention study. Since then, others have been done. And what they generally show is that there is this re um, likelihood of a reduction in risk, but it's not consistent. Not all trials show benefit of a multifactorial intervention. And the amount of benefit is fairly limited. Um, and um, what these trials, um, what this highlights is one of the, the challenges with this work is, is actually connecting individual patients with um, the services to address the multiple risk factors that they might have. And so that's a challenge that we, we need to address. Um, one of the most common interventions um, um, in multifactorial um, trials, sorry, is exercise. And exercise has been consistently shown to reduce falls risk in older adults, whether they're high risk for falling or um, um, a lower risk of falling. You see a benefit in participating in exercise. There was some concern that um, you know, in having someone start up physical activity might pre expose them to more falls, you know, falls um, uh, risk by um, you know, starting to move around more and exposing them to tripping hazards. But numerous uh, uh, studies have shown using accelerometers that, um, the, that higher amounts of activity do confer a lower risk of, of, of falling. And so um, one of the challenges though is, is trying to link or connect people, older adults to um, evidence-based exercise programs. And so that's an area that we've been working on here at the University of Washington and the um, HIPRC. And one of the studies, uh, one of the programs that I've been working on is called Enhanced Fitness. This is an evidence-based exercise program in which older adults um, exercise three, days, uh, uh, three times a week, typically Monday, Wednesday, Fridays for an hour. And it involves um, strength, endurance, and balance training. It's recommended by CDC for arthritis management, and it's recommended for falls prevention. Um, and with the pandemic, um, we developed a protocol for uh, delivering remotely. And now we've had, through um, some pilot funding through the uh, Injury Center, we've demonstrated that older adults in rural areas um, are able to um, engage in remotely delivered exercise in this program and show benefit in terms of their physical capacity, their, their time up and go um, performance improves, 
their, their um, amount of arthritis related pain and their functioning improves. And so um, we are now doing a larger study across the state in which we're evaluating um, doing a, what we call a non-inferiority trial. So evaluating whether remotely delivered enhanced fitness um, is similar, confers similar benefit as in-person um, delivery of enhanced fitness. So for those providers that in the audience who would like to refer their patients with arthritis to our um, um, study, please use this QR code and um, just enter your contact information and we'll reach out to you with um, more information about the, our study and our project. So I just wanna summarize here that the key takeaways are um, that falls are a leading cause of injury, including um, TBI in older adults, and that there is a growing burden of falls in the, um, the US population and in Washington state. Um, and it's uh, driven by a combination of population aging and um, likely a combination of living longer with chronic health conditions that predispose to falls risk. Um, also an important takeaway is that um, multiple risk factors increase the risk of falling um, and that, the his, that having a history of falls is the number one risk factor for falling. And that although multifactorial interventions are recommended, uh, the quality of evidence is low, but the quality of evidence for exercise is very strong. So for providers out there, really encourage your um, patients to engage in more physical activity. And if, um, and if, if necessary, um, um, if they have functional impairments, then um, uh, physical therapy makes a lot of sense for getting them to in address impairments. So that's, um, um, that's, that's it for my presentation. I did wanna point out that, um, that if you'd like to learn more about falls prevention tools, you can go to CDC's website, uh, as well as the HIPRC's website. They have, we have um, a lot of information on how um, preventing falls. So with that, I'll stop and we'll happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Kashang. That was great. And I, I, I'll just say uh, in advance, I share your admiration for, uh, for Dr. Tanetti. I've followed her work over many years. So um, at this point, I will turn it over to uh, Dr. Frank Jackson, who is uh, head of the TBI, the uh, Injury Center here at St. Luke's Rehab Institute. And I will let Frank talk about his experience with the topics you've talked to, talked about and uh, share some local perspective. And remember, those of you in the audience, please put in your questions into the chat. So Frank, it's all yours. Great. OK, well, thanks a lot. And thanks to the uh, prior presenters for all the information that uh, has been given out so far. So uh, I am a rehabilitation medicine doctor uh, here at St. Luke's in Spokane. And uh, I just wanted to talk a few minutes about uh, some of the resources we have available here in Spokane for uh, patients with concussion and TBI. So fortunately, we have a spectrum of care and resources available here to us. Um, we started off with our talk this evening, uh, looking at uh, concussions in pediatric patients. And fortunately, the Providence has athletic trainers at seven local high schools here that work closely with the Providence Sports Medicine Clinic um, for follow-up and return to care and, and return to learning and play. Um, including uh, clinics that are actually held in some of the local high schools, which is kind of neat. Um, the athletic trainers here, uh, they do utilize the sport concussion assessment tool that was uh, discussed earlier, as well as using the vestibular ocular motor screen to evaluate athletes with concussion. The athletic trainers, again, working with the sports medicine uh, physicians, utilize a graduated six-step return to play process that begins with at least one day of return to school without lingering issues. Thinking back about some of those uh, return to learning issues separate from return to play. Uh, the other seven local high schools here, they have uh, athletic trainers as well that are working with uh, providers from Shriners as well as MultiCare. Uh, thinking about our last talk and about therapy, uh, both to potentially prevent falls before they happen as well as rehabilitating after falls, 
Um, we have outpatient therapy and physician uh, management available here at St. Luke's for concussion and TBI. We have specialized neurotherapists here, uh, including physical therapists who treat the vestibular system as the inner ear uh, gyrometer system and balance issues for patients, as well as working on associated neck problems that might occur with, uh, with traumatic brain injuries and concussions. We have occupational therapy that's available to treat vision and life skill problems and speech language pathologists who evaluate treat problems with attention, memory, and judgment. Um, some neat equipment here available to work with patients who are uh, having some of these issues, including uh, what's called DynaVision, which is this neat um, light-based uh, therapy board that works with patients who have issues with divided attention and um, slowed reaction time. Uh, therapists often also are able to uh, inter uh, interact with school-based therapists. So if some of those school accommodations are necessary, uh, we can work with them as well. Uh, we fortunately have a few, uh, two neuro-optometrists here in Spokane, Dr. Zollinger and Dr. Wiley, um, who are both available to treat vision-related issues um, that might result from concussion and TBI, thinking about using things like prism glasses as well as uh, visual rehabilitation. Um, and if someone sustains a TBI that's serious enough for hospitalization, they might benefit from coming to acute inpatient rehabilitation here at St. Luke's. Um, inpatient rehabilitation, so this is after someone has been at acute care hospital and they've had a significant fall or a motor vehicle collision that's caused them to have ongoing uh, physical and cognitive uh, deficits. Um, they might come to inpatient at St. Luke's um, here in Spokane to do um, inpatient rehab, which would include a holistic team-based approach to uh, patient care, including uh, with the guidance of rehabilitation medicine physicians, such as myself, physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech language pathology. But then we also have some other really cool things to round out our interdisciplinary team, including psychologists, case managers, recreation therapists, and dietitians, uh, to really, again, have that holistic uh, view of patient recovery. Thinking about uh, some of the other issues after TBI, psychosocial stress um, can be disabling and often finding support groups can be helpful. Um, the Brain Injury Alliance of Washington, the TBI Council of Washington, and St. Luke's also all, all have support groups that might be helpful. And I'll post some of the information in the chat um, for folks tonight um, if they're interested. The Brain Injury Alliance of Washington also has a nice series of podcasts that's available as well as virtual classes to provide education on concussion and TBI. Um, after TBI, again, we know risks of suicide, depression, are elevated. Um, and so here in Spokane, we have Frontier Behavioral Health, um, who it provides a regional crisis line that's available for if you or a loved one are thinking about hurting yourself or somebody else and just need some support. Um, there's also the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, as well as the Veterans Crisis Lifeline that are other good resources. We also know that after TBI, that substance use disorder um, is at increased risk. And Spokane has many Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous uh, meetings that might be helpful. Lastly, um, we know that uh, patients with TBI often uh, can suffer from food insecurity in the long term. And the Eastern Washington 211 line um, can assist with food insecurity as well as provide other resources um, to help however they can. And I'll go ahead and I'll post some of uh, that information in the chat for anybody if they're interested. And um, that's what I have for us tonight. Thanks, Frank. I really appreciate that. And you know, I think uh, having those resources available to us here in Eastern Washington is really a bonus for, for everybody in, in the east side of the state. I'd like to move on to a couple of questions for our panelists. And, and first, before I do that, I want to just highlight I think one of the things that you've done is, is really highlighted two separate diseases, disease processes that are really are epidemic for us, but are just flying under the radar. And I want to thank all of our speakers for bringing that to light. It's really uh, what we're seeing is the tip of the iceberg. And I think we have to be develop better tools to diagnose these things, 
get them uh, get a light shown on them so that people can get the help they need. Um, Kashang, there was a couple of questions um, in the that came about about any under understanding or reason uh, for the higher fall rate in eastern Washington uh, compared to other regions. And do you, I know that epidemiologic data is not uh, cause and effect, but what what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I'm not. Um, there's no clear explanation for this, as you noted. Those data are not adjusted for age. So it's conceivable that uh, there's a little bit more rurality in the Eastern um, EMS region. And so um, uh, because of that, you might have a higher rate of uh, falls there. It's also um, con you know, conceivable that there's just less provision for rehabilitation for people who are more rural. Um, um, I know that Dr. Um, Jackson has highlighted fantastic resources and programs that are available um, through uh, at Spokane at St. Luke's, I think. Um, um, but there's lim there's just less evidence-based programming, community-based programming available in more rural areas. And so that might be driving some of this. And that there's tends to be um, higher rates of arthritis and musculoskeletal conditions and um, obesity in rural than less rural areas. And so that combination might be driving a higher rate of falls. Thank you. Yeah, I was thinking the fact that we, that folks in the rural areas may not have as good access for their underlying medical conditions. Frank, do you have any thoughts on that, about the increased rate? I um, mean, you know, I was just gonna bring up socioeconomic um, considerations that might be occurring out there as well. You know, we know that with uh, socioeconomic disparity, that um, there are increased rates of uh, substance use. And unfortunately, a lot of my moderate to severe traumatic brain injury patients I see, um, uh, there's a lot of intoxication involved with it. That was one thing I was gonna ask, is that um, that wasn't highlighted on any of your slides, Kashang, was the, the prevalence of alcohol use as a contributor to falls. Um, any comments on that? Was that on there? I didn't, if it was, I missed it. It's not a um, it's not a common cause, but um, it's certainly can, yeah it makes sense that it would be a, a cause of, of falling. Um, but more often than not, um, seems like uh, that medications, um, specifically those that affects you know um, centrally acting medication that affects psychoactive that are psychoactive. Um, contribute to greater falls risk, antidepressants, opioids, uh, um, muscle relaxants. These tend to these tend to um, be commonly used in the older adult population and draw, um, increase risk of falling. But um, I will look into data re regarding alcohol use and, and falls risk. It's a good suggestion. I'll just say we just got a chat uh, from one of our rural providers who mentions that. Uh, in rural areas, the rural folks, people living in rural areas tend to be older. Um, there's less infrastructure, fewer sidewalks, more dirt roads, and that sort of thing that might contribute to the falls. Um, Monica, there's a couple of questions that have come up uh, regarding um, a prior history of, uh, of concussion, as it was called, and are there any long-term consequences? There are a couple of people who had temporal uh, concussions, and there was somebody else who uh, also said that they had had concussions that were perhaps not underdiagnosed or undertreated and whether yeah. there were any consequences. So can you share your comments? Sure, happy to. You know, I, I think I responded in the chat bot. It responded. So, so basically I think, you know, a lot of our interventions are driven by symptoms. So I think if, you know, if anyone has had a history of concussion and have um, symptoms that, they feel are related to that, uh, it might be worth, I think it would be a good idea to talk with their primary care provider about those. I mean, the fact that, you know, if you're, if the concussion is so remote as in four, 20 years ago or 30 years ago, it's less likely that, you know, that they're going to cause an acute issue now. But as we know from, uh, you know, the wrestling world, boxing world, 
um, you know, there, there could be long-term consequences of repeat injuries to the brain. Uh, and that really has to be evaluated on an individual basis. Okay. You know, I'll just uh, share personal experiences. My, my son had a, had a fall and a, a concussion um, and he was evaluated um, for that. He wasn't in a contact sport, but his team was able to say he couldn't return even to train. Um, but again, his, his college coursework um, flew under the radar and he experienced a great deal of frustration of that inability to concentrate inability to perform and the disparity between return to play and return to learn and especially at a college where you're there to learn hopefully um, was striking um, so I just say it's, it's really underreported and and, and really you know I, I couldn't agree with you more and I think it's only in the last decade or so that we've really started to focus on return to learn it's been play and then now we're saying look learn before play that's a culture shift and particularly for athletes who are so invested in the sport and for the athletic directors who um, are invested in their, in, in, in their job of athletics, um, I think we really need folks, parents, society to say, look, academics before sports, and that's a big statement to make for, for people who are athletes. Um, I saw a question in the chat box in terms of um, is there any plans to pursue legislation? So we've been trying to do that. You know, we met with legislators um, four or five, three, four or five years ago, impressing upon the need to add an amendment to the Zachary Leisted law as a, an add an amendment, like a return to learn a writer. Okay. And then the pandemic happened, it all went quiet and out came this house bill 2731, which addressed the need for schools to report concussions. And for those of us who spent time with legislators saying, well, that's good, but it's not enough because we need to develop a return to learn program so that students who need temporary accommodations get them, students who need 504 plans get those, and actually students who improve, the 504 plan should be rescinded and they need to be returned to classroom. What we're learning is that students who get on accommodations or adjusted academic schedules stay on those because the schools don't have a process by which to continuously monitor. And so there are students who don't take tests at all and, and their academics is really suffering. So I think this is a big issue. Um, and so I appreciate the question on what should we be pursuing legislation? I would say, yes, we should. You know, one thing that talk about culture shift, um, there was a, a question in the chat about um, uh, from a volunteer coach and what, what advice you might have for them. And, and it strikes me, and I'm interested to see what uh, Monica, you and Frank have to say about this is, you know, one of the things that happens is I think kids or athletes or wherever they are, it tends to be underreported. So the coaches or the supervising adult, if you will, um, may not have access to that information to do anything. What are your, your thoughts on getting kids to report when they have a head bonk? Uh, and then what, what do coaches do if there's not an existing protocol? Well, I think that the, the system's not incentivized to address this issue, okay? The incentives, you know, in reading the literature around what incentivizes coaches to report um, it's really, they're incentivized to, to win the game and to have a, 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 a workforce, a, a play force to, to make that game happen. So unless there's a law that emphasizes and prioritizes returning to learn before returning to play and requires school systems to have um, into, you know, integrated communication strategies and resources schools adequately to provide that system, it's not, in my opinion, it's, it's not gonna work. You know, I'll add that um, in speaking with our lead athletic trainer over the seven high schools here, um, that with students becoming more and more educated on some of the long-term effects of a repeated concussions, 
that um, his comment to me was that they're seeing more and more student athletes that are, you know, quote, retiring from, from football or whatever sport they're playing and, and suffering concussions are um, in the high school environment. So thinking about getting to educating those students themselves so they can understand some of the potential long-term implications of this uh, might be helpful as well. That's great, thank you. Um, there's a question that came up about um, if we get return to, to learn plans and kids who really don't want to, is there a chance of malingering um, and kids not uh, wanting to go to school, not wanting to take those tests? And um, I think that'd be a very small proportion, but Monica, have you had any? any yeah, I mean, I think, tests? sure. You know, I think, right. I, I think that's a fair question in the sense that, you know, it's human behavior, right? Um, but I would say that the, implementation of a repeated monitoring process and an evaluation process um, that results in more formal evaluation after four weeks, probably the work burden of doing all of that will weed itself out. I mean, I think that, you know, I can't, we can't, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm also a pediatrician and I can say, you know, malingering in children and adolescents happens, but I think it's a diagnosis of exclusion. And I think that particularly when we're talking about the brain that may be doing the behavioral changes. I think we have to be pretty sure that it's not an injury before we attribute just, you know, adolescent choices to malingering. Yeah, very, very true. I think we have to always assume positive intent whenever possible. Um, uh, Kashang, I had a question regarding change gears a little bit back to the falls and, and the exercise component of that. Um, you know, you, you alluded to the variable effects of exercise and uh, at least my reading of the literature is that uh, it depends on the type of exercise that's being done and the type of exercise that is at all beneficial has to be balance based. So for instance, the sit and be fit uh, kind of exercises or riding an exercise bike may not be beneficial to you. Do you have any thoughts on that? And then, and then we'll turn it over to Frank. Yeah, I think um, it really depends on impairments that your patient has. Uh, um, but generally speaking, strength and endurance training programs do confer benefit. Um, I would say that the systematic reviews have shown that any exercise um, program, no matter what the composition of the actual exercises are, do confer benefit. Um, but I, I certainly think that ones that incorporate more dynamic movement, Tai Chi, for example, is one that's the evidence base is growing. It's not as robust as strength and endurance training, but um, anything that involves dynamic movement can help improve, reduce falls risk. Um, uh, and that for people with arthritis, which is very common in the older adult population, that too helps to improve pain, um, pain management, and um, and it reduces, you know, helps improve um, people's ability to just function generally, and um, has this rewarding effect of improving activity overall and um, mood and other things that tend to travel with pain. And so um, I don't think, I would definitely for recommendations out there, definitely, I, I don't think there's one particular exercise program that is um, that we ought to prescribe. We should really try to find programs that individual patients like to engage in, um, activities they like to do, and that um, was more likely to lead to higher adherence rates. Um, so I think we can recommend a, a variety of physical activities, but if you had to pin me down, I would say strength and endurance training are the combination of the sweet spot that can help reduce falls. You know, I think you just hit on something that like any of us who want to exercise more, it has to be enjoyable, it has to be something we want to do. So <laughs> Frank, yeah. you have thoughts? For sure. You know, I was just going to add, you know, like he said, you know, finding things that are enjoyable for people and even thinking about things that are as simple as just walking programs mm -hmm. and getting out and having people move. And, you know, it's hard for some folks to be able to incorporate, um, you know, exercise programs into their daily lives, but at least by encouraging some simple um, 
increase aerobic exercise with walking can be very beneficial. Yeah, yeah I call. definitely uh, totally agree with what Dr. Jackson just said um, that walking does confer a lot of benefits, but in terms of falls risk, um, for a lot of older people, there, there is a need to improve uh, strength and balance. And so um, I, in, especially in light of someone's comment about why you know that rural areas have more environmental barriers, um, often to even to, to walking, um, I just put a plug in for remotely delivered exercise programs are an option to, to think about, um, especially ones that have live instruction. And so, uh, because for a lot of older people who haven't had experience exercising and don't feel comfortable with um, starting out having an instructor to support them and a community of other older people engaging in exercise tends to help develop community and confidence in the ability to engage in exercise. So um, that's something to think about. Um, um, for those who are out in more rural areas, that there are a variety of increasing a number of, of exercise programs that are delivered online. The other thing I'll just, I'll just comment on, you know, it, it seems to me that um, the more active some an elderly person is, uh, the more risk they are for falling. You have more opportunity to fall. And so I think yeah. there's a little bit of, of a tension there that it's, it's inherent in what we're doing. So. Um, just to be aware of that as well. Uh, if you're not doing anything, you're not. If you're just bed bound, you're not going to fall. Um, all right, um, Monica, I, I have a couple of two questions for you. Um, one is uh, kind of about this tension between the increased awareness that we have uh, of TBI and concussion, and on the other hand, one of the comments uh, in the questions came in is, is the diagnosis of concussion is pretty squishy as opposed yeah. to really defined. So I'll let right. you take that on. Yeah, I think it is squishy, you know, because we didn't call it TBI from the very beginning. We kind of thought it was something else. It's really traumatic brain injury. That's what it is. It's just a matter of like, you know, what, how severe it is and what are the symptoms and what are the complications from it? So I think we should be referring to it as such so that people don't think they're two separate things. The other point is that we have biomarkers that are FDA approved, but we don't use them because there aren't enough studies to suggest how and when we should be using them. So GFAP and UCHL1, for example, are FDA approved biomarkers to detect traumatic brain injury. But we don't have a good prognostic model. We don't have a good diagnostic model and the National Academies of Science uh, accelerate TBI care and research report that just came out two months ago. Um, I was fortunate to be part of that 18 member task force of um, folks from around the country. And what we put together were some recommendations to guide the next 10 years of our work, which is to really try and classify TBI correctly. So we don't over and under diagnose and we don't use squishy definitions. So maybe it's a combination of symptoms and biomarkers and imaging. We just don't have that multimodal evaluation tool. So we did do, for example, you know, when this thing about sports and concussion came out, everybody was ordering MRIs for uh, concussion, okay? And when we looked at thousands of MRIs, what we learned was that they were mostly negative. And in fact, uh, micro hemorrhages were not very common at all, right? And so I think there is a risk when there's a new condition of, over-diagnosing because you suddenly realized you've been under-diagnosing it for decades. So the pendulum does tend to swing in medicine to some degree. So I would say yes, but it's really dependent on impairment and uh, symptom, you know, symptom-driven diagnosis at present. So are we over-diagnosing some? Probably. Are we under-diagnosing some? Sure, that we know. Tough balance. Um, one last question, um, and then we'll we'll kind of wrap up. But one of the things, uh, both for Monica and Frank, um, is you know we you talked about cognitive rest after a uh, traumatic brain injury, and um, 
A, what does that really look like in practice? And particularly when you're thinking about learning. And then the other question is, Monica, in your, in your slides, you noted that the, there were various societies that had varying recommendations. So can you speak to kind of why that is? Was it just evidence-based or is it different interpretations of the data? So I'll just stop there. Yeah, I think the first is in a, not enough data. The second is injecting consensus, expert consensus in, in as a layer on top of the paucity of data. And the third is kind of public pressure to, to release something because practitioners wanted some guidance. So I think the different professional societies reflect different specialties. So they come at it from that particular vantage point. And so I think the heterogeneity, right, in and the variability in the language and in the recommendations reflects all of those, all of those challenges. And then what about, um, what does cognitive rest look like yeah. in practice? Well, I think it looks like, so I'll give you an example, a concrete example. So I'm an anesthesiologist. I was in the operating room. Today is Wednesday. So this might have been yesterday, actually. And I received a phone call from a colleague who said, um, can I come, can you come, can you come talk to me? I'm sitting in location X. I said, okay. I went over there and I said, yes, what's up? And this person said, well, I was on my one wheeler or whatever, right? One wheeler. Um, and I was riding and I fell and I hit my head in the back. And I said, okay. And the question was, well, do I have a concussion? I said, I don't know. Um, what, did, what happened then? And the person said, well, I, you know, I didn't lose consciousness. I got up and I rode again, this time with a helmet, this time with a helmet. And King County has just repealed its bicycle helmet law, right? <laughs> Pierce County has repealed it. And so now we're, we're in this equity safety debate, right? Of how do we manage this? So I fell again and I felt really woozy and I went home and then I felt okay. I rested for two days. I just took it easy and I was fine. So I came to work today. Okay, good. But throughout the day, I'm getting this increasing headache and the lights are bothering me and I'm feeling really tired. So it's two days, it's within the first week. So my suggestion was that they go, they stop stressing the neurons that are adversely behaving to the stimulus. So the cognitive, the, the, the cognitive processes for the, from the, for the work and this external stimulation, which was not there at home when you were taking rest is now present at work. So you graduate your activity and you scale it back. So the question to me was, do I need a CT scan right away, right? Probably not because it's two days, right? And it's not the type of headache, but the, the point again is sort of like they, you know, we, it's graduated. Does that answer? I hope yeah. that answered, yeah. Thank you, do you have thoughts? Yeah, I, I just describe it as sub-threshold. Right, so you got to find what that point is and where it's going to produce symptoms and then just back off a little bit. Just try that for a day or two and then try pushing the envelope again. All right, great. Well, I think with that, I want to thank uh, Monica and Kishong right, just for, for coming and uh, sharing your knowledge, sharing your perspective, your research with us tonight. Uh, it's really helpful for our community. Uh, still have lots of people on the call and just just want to give you a heartfelt thank you for shining the light on, on these difficult topics. I also want to thank, uh, once again, our, our uh, sponsors, uh, Providence Healthcare, MultiCare, Spokane County Regional Health District, uh, Spokane County Medical Society, and the UW Population Health Initiative. And then I know there was a question in the chat. This recording will be available to all participants who registered. So uh, hopefully you'll be able to distribute that to your school nurses and coaches. And uh, we just appreciate your being curious and being with us tonight. 
So thank you all to everybody. Thank you. Good night. Thanks for the opportunity.